Hello. Uh, just a little correction. I said we had three more sessions. We actually had five, which is now just four. Does that make sense? We had three. We actually had five. Now we are just four left. Uh, sorry. Thanks. Hey, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here, great weather, uh, I now live in London, even though I'm Portuguese, so it's great to be back in good weather and beautiful Lyon, it's wonderful, wonderful to be here. Today I'm going to be talking about a project that we built at Nojutsu, uh, that's the company where I work. These are my cats, people like them and it makes me feel like calm when I'm doing a presentation to look at something I love. Uh, this is me. Uh, if you want to talk to me, that's my Twitter handle. This is me getting married last summer. Um, if you have questions, come ask me after the talk. Uh, I won't have many answers, but I'll still talk to you. Uh, I'm a business-oriented person. Uh, what I do at Nojitsu is mostly talk to people and talk to customers, talk to partners, and do all the boring stuff. Uh, but I, I'm still a techie. Uh, I studied computers and I do a lot of open source. Uh, I work at Nojitsu. How many of you are familiar with Nojitsu? For those of you who aren't, uh, Nojitsu is just a very easy way to deploy your Node.js applications. Uh, we focus on Node.js because it's technology that allowed us to build the infrastructure uh, very fast, but we would be we would be capable of running other things, but we focus just on Node because that's our core competency. Uh, very recently, we've open sourced most of our stack. Uh, if you're curious about how Nojutsu works, we launched this thing called OpsMeso, which is basically all of our closed source tooling, but now open source. Uh, and it's what I, as a business person, sell to customers every day. Uh, so it might be interesting if you're looking at doing orchestration in the clouds. Mostly of what it does, it's, it's about keeping a pool of servers and different data centers online, making sure your load balancers are capable of leveraging that, having custom rules to access custom applications across the... All of that stuff that you need to do that you never want to touch because you just want to write an app. Yeah, that's it. Uh, also created this firm called The Note Firm, uh, which some of you might be familiar. And I also run a conference called Lisbon JavaScript, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I've added a, a secret link there, which actually sells tickets for five seconds, but the tickets are not on sale. That's just for you guys uh, before the ticket sale. So now I'm going to change it so the internet doesn't see it. Uh, <laughs> or it will be a mess. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Node HTTP proxy. If you didn't find it, you can ask me later. Uh, I'm going to talk about Node HTTP proxy. This is where you can find it. And it is basically a Node.js load balancer. That's how we use it. So you get connections and you can route it to different servers. You can do very smart things. Um, if you're curious about it, uh, that sounds kind of crazy to do a Node.js uh, load balancer, an HTTP proxy in Node. Uh, and if you're curious about it, you should definitely check out Arnas write up on it. He did uh, proper benchmarking. Uh, of all of these proxies, and he found out that ours is the worst by 10 times. <laughs> uh, but one thing that is about Node is that it's not just about, it's not about the raw performance and how it compares to something that is implemented in C. It's about how fast you can make your idea come to life at a very high scale. So maybe you won't go to Facebook scale, 
but it might be that you just use Node HTTP proxy and it lasts forever for you. For instance, in Nojitsu, that probably means that we have 10 load balancers instead of seven, which for us, it's really not that much of a big deal. Um, anyway, you can read this. It's in blog.thirdeden.com. It's a great comparison if you're then curious about how these proxies all work underneath. Uh, one thing that is unique about Node HTTP proxy is that it was the first, first it's open source, and the second thing is that it was the first one to support WebSockets natively. So you start HTTP proxy, and you're done. Like, you can serve your WebSockets, you can serve your HTTP all the same, and you don't have to worry about it. So it's very, very easy to use. Uh, what I'm going to do on this talk is basically two things. I'm going to show you how Node is really, really cool uh, and really, really fast to prototype things that you want to come to fruition that otherwise would be a little bit more of work. And second, show how easy it is to use Node HTTP proxy to do this load balancing and setting it up. So at Nojitsu, uh, so HTTP proxy is completely compatible with the WebSockets buzzword. It's awesome. And what we do is we have our load balancer here subscribes to CouchDB, which sends David Bowie's under the changes feed. And then that's how we figure out in which server the things are. Uh, the container, the app model for us, is something that we call Haibu, which is also open source. And so when a user comes, we just see where it is and we proxy it to it. Um, the way that we figure out if, so how do we figure out which user goes to which server with WebSockets, right? Like, that's the sticky question. Uh, the sticky sessions question. And what we do is we just see the IP and we always route that IP to the same server. So it's a very simple algorithm. It's actually so simple that I'm going to code it right now so you can see it. And, I, I still, and I'm going to code like an app first just to like make for time. No, I'm joking. I'm going to, but just to show you how to code a full thing in Node. So if you think about Node, uh, how many people here like when you say Node, how many people think about these things? The people that work in Node. Well, wow, surprising. What do, you, what do you guys think Node is if it's not these things? Because for me, this is what Node is. This is how I use it every day. So for most people, it's JavaScript in the server, whatever that means. Sharing views on the server and the UI thing, which I don't use, the DOM or whatever, right? I'm not a front-end person. Uh, but for people that are excited about Node, this is, for instance, at Nojitsu, this is what we use it for. We use it to build infrastructure. So it's very cool that we just can start a network protocol fairly easy. There's a parser that worked on it. There's a server. There's a client. And we can just connect a lot of these components. And we can make an infrastructure. And we can make decisions and prototype uh, like new products in Nojitsu very, very fast. That runs on top of LibUV. Uh, which is just an event loop, uh, like LibEV. The only difference is that the guys beyond Node, actually Bert and Ryan, had the work to port everything to Windows. So everything works in Windows. So that's why people now use LibEV a lot, because it works in Windows. I think it actually works in Windows better than Linux, according to Bert. But I, I don't know. I'll take their word for it. They, they're better than me at that. And then there's V8, uh, which is a really good VM. Uh, actually, after the JVM, it was like the first VM that people like looked at it and actually, I don't know, liked. Uh, and finally, uh, a key component of the Node ecosystem is NPM. Node just comes with no batteries included. It's just the protocols and just some small helpers that you have to use in Node Core. And then everything else goes to NPM. So all these debates about promises, blah, 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 whatever Tim was talking about. <laughs> go into NPM. And then if you want to use them, you NPM install them and you use them. It's very simple. So the thing that, for me, it's exciting about Node is prototyping products really, really fast with a non-black box approach. So I was actually talking to someone very just upstairs about that the fact that NPM, for instance, runs on a DNS server that is written in Node. So there's 1 million, 100 million requests a month right, Good job. Uh, that are currently running on NPM that was growing 100% every month. That was in January, so you can do the math. Um, and this is basically how the DNS server works. It's very simple. You just write it. 
And I can even show you this right now. So I can go here, and I can just run exactly that code. There's the code. We run it. Can you guys read it, or is it too small? OK, a little bigger. There we go. And I can just dig and see the response that you see, like one, two, three, four. You could do this in another language, but Node makes this very easy to do. So yeah, uh, NPM is running on a DNS server that is a Node. This is most of the reactions I get. I also get this reaction sometimes. Uh, so that's it. Now I think I, I framed what we're going to do here. And now I'm going to just show you. What we're going to do is we're going to build an app, an HTTP app. First, it's going to serve just a static HTTP page. Then what we're going to do is add WebSockets. Uh, we're going to use Engine.io, because Engine.io is a better version of Socket.io. I, I hope I don't get killed for saying these things. Correct, Arno? Better version of Socket.io, which doesn't kill your servers or your load balancers. Uh, <laughs> and then we're, we're going to get that app, and then we're going to load balance it with sticky sessions with Node HTTP proxy, just so you guys understand what the product is all about. So the first thing we need to do, in NPM, every time you see this require, like all the things that you see, like node static, it's either on node core or you have to do NPM install that string to get it. So in this case, you do NPM install node static. I'll share the code in the end with you guys. So then you can require HTTP. Is this too big, too small, a little bigger? Good? It's too big. It's too big. Uh, then I can say, OK, create a new static server and serve from the public directory. On the public directory, I just have like a bunch of front end files, like an HTML file and some JavaScript that is just doing some fancy WebRTC things, like taking pictures and making the page not look like an engineer made it. Uh, then we can just create a server. This is how you create a server in Node. Uh, you say HTTP create server, and then you give it a callback function. And the callback function is run every time you get a connection. So when you get a connection, you get a request and a response object, and then you respond. This was what Tim was basically arguing that is wrong. So if you want to serve files, you can say whenever the request is done, just serve the file. Listen on that port, and we're done. So we can just run the server here. Who has run something like this in the past? So not a lot of people are familiar with Node. Cool. OK. So we can just run it and go to this port. And we have everything just being shared, like directly from that files. So this is pretty simple. Now what we need to do is just add some web sockets so we can connect and actually chat. What we're going to do is we're going to have that app that you just saw, which has basically like a, a place where you talk. And this is going to connect to the server via WebSocket. It's going to send something to the HTTP server. Then the HTTP server is going to connect to IRC, the actual free node. And then it's going to drop a, a message in free node. And then from free node, someone can respond back to your website. If it sounds complicated, it really isn't. And I'll show you. So the first thing you need to do is you need to require Engine.io. And then you have to attach your HTTP server to the Engine.io object. 
which Tim does not approve. <laughs> then you go, whenever you get a connection, uh, a WebSocket connection, you create a UUID for this connection, just so you can identify who this person is. And it's going to be good for the conversations, because I want people that are chatting on the page, they are going to IRC, but I don't want them to see everything that is an IRC or would just be an IRC client. I want them to be able to talk. So we're going to use this hash to identify the person. So we require this IRC module, which I'll show you in a second. Then we instantiate it. We say, OK, this client, this socket, is going to have this UUID. We log it. And then we're going to respond to two kind of events. When we get a message, OK? from the website. It sends a WebSocket message that we want to relay to IRC, and whenever someone disconnects. Those are basically the two events that we need to work on. Now, as you can see here, I required this IRC module here. I didn't want to show you like, like how the code goes, because it's kind of like side to what real time is. Uh, but I, I can show you like the full completed code, because it, it's fairly simple to do like an IR, IRC bot in Node. You can just require this module here, IRCB. And then it's basically just boilerplate code to connect to a channel. And then say, hey, I'm connected. And if, if you can't connect, then just crash the, the program. And it will restart. So it's fairly simple. The only thing that exists here that is really important is that when the IRC, when you get a message from that channel, right? you need to relay it back to the socket. So this is where you do it. If you get something that has one of those UUIDs we generated, you, and there is a socket, we send that message to the socket. So we connect to IRC. Whenever a message comes, if there is a socket that is listening for, for this kind of message, for this hash, then we relay it back. So on this side, so that's the other side. That's the IRC to the client, from the client to IRC, we have to do it on this socket on message. So what we can just do is, if the client is not connected, we close the socket. Yeah, let me put this a little smaller. And if not, we just relay the message. So let's see this working. So we can just run the file. So we can just run this code. As you can see here, it's now connected to IRC with this guy. I just created some nickname. And in this channel, you can see that this guy just joined. That's the bot. OK, now I can go to the page, can refresh it. And I authorized it to take a picture of me, so I'm going to get close. And I can say, like, hello. And this message got sent to the HTTP. So via WebSockets gets sent to our server. And now our server relays that to the IRC server. So in here, you can see the message. And because I created this unique ID that identifies the person that is on the page, I can just talk back to people. So I can say, and if this works, I get a message on that side. Let me just put this bigger. So this is just a sample app that shows you like how easy it is to bind these things using Node. That, that's the main point, right? We got an HTTP server, does WebSockets, then we have it connecting to IRC, and all of that was just a bunch of lines of code that was completely unimpressive. And for Node, that's a feature. Like, it wasn't hard to do. It was fairly easy. Now, what Node HTTP proxy does is it gives you a very, very simple way 
of doing load balancing of things like this that are sticky. So my computer will always go to the same server. Make sense? Because that's really like the only hard problem with WebSockets. It's not, but like Arnu talked about all the others. So let's do that. So what we need to do is we need to change this script here in a way that it accepts a port. And I'm going to run it in two different ports. Uh, and then I'm just going to use node HTTP proxy to say, like, go to that one or go to the other one. And if it's me, it's, I'm always going to go to the same server. So you get load balanced, but sticky. So we get the port there. Uh, we just parse argv2, or we set a default port. Everyone knows what this plus is. I remember one time, like, I used this because I saw in someone's code. It actually gets a string, and it's like the best way in JavaScript to convert a string to an integer, uh, which is crazy. So one day someone told me that, and I did it in my code. And then I was like looking at the code, and I was like, why the hell did I put a plus here? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know, but, but back then I was like, am I crazy? Like, what am I plus? Like, God damn it, JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so now I know. So you listen on that port. The plus is going to change that to an integer. Uh, and then you just have to listen on that port and change the message. So now, now I can go here and say, like, run index on 1337. and I can, on this one here, run it on 1338, and now I have two servers. And they're both going to connect to IRC, as you can see there. So now I have two people like on IRC on the channel. But don't start doing this with messier fr with your friends, by the way, and start like spawning like a million IRC bots. Um, so now I have it here. And, and if I go to 1337 or 1338, of course, it will be there. And now what we want to do is, create a node HTTP proxy layer. So let's do that. Any questions so far? You guys are not a very engaged audience. <laughs> so let's open the proxy. So for node HTTP proxy, to do the load balancer, so we require HTTP. This is node core HTTP model, module. Uh, and then we run and we require HTTP proxy. If you want to install HTTP proxy, we do something like npm install HTTP proxy. And if you want to save it in your package.json, you put minus minus save. And that's what you do for all the modules. So if you get any message saying like, oh, this module doesn't exist, you just do that. It's like the easiest thing to fix. Uh, we create a seed. Uh, this is for our hash algorithm. And then we say what ports are open, which in this case is 1337 and 1338. So I've included here an hashing algorithm that I didn't want to write in front of you because I wouldn't be capable. But it's fairly simple to hash an IP just to a modulus so I can choose like which one. Like There's a bunch of ways to do this. And you guys, probably all of you know how to do it. It's on GitHub if you want to see it later. Uh, but it's really something that should be very easy to find. So then we create an HTTP proxy server. And we're going to listen on 8080. I'm good. Uh, then we say, like, OK, the IP is the request connection remote address. This is going to give me the IP address of each person. Now, one thing that was confusing to me in our our load balancing was like, oh, but if I use the IP, it means that my computer will always go to the same server, which is not ideal. If all computers have the same IP, this is going to be a problem, right? But if you want to solve this and make it per browser session, you would have to use cookies, and it's like nasty, and it's, gonna, it's not something you want to do, and you have to do it at an application layer. So this is kind of like the best way I could sh demonstrate this to you. And this is actually what we do in production. And it works fairly well if you have a high number of servers and not everyone coming from the same IP, which would be a problem. Uh, 
So then we use the hashing algorithm to figure out if there's an IP, which of the servers do we want to hit. And if there's no IP, if we can figure it out, then just go to the default one because you can't just, you know, you have to be sticky. So you have to decide the, the, the default value so that if there's no IP, it's always going to go there. And then you can just figure out the port based on the hash that you calculated. Finally, you just proxy it. So recap, require HTTP proxy, get some hashing algorithm that allows you to determine which server you want to hit out of, for instance, right now we have two servers, but we could have 10, 20, whatever. Uh, create the proxy server, get the IP address, hash it, and then figure out what server it is and just proxy the request. So as our new, for instance, compared like many HTTP proxies that were faster than Node HTTP proxy, but the reality is that that's just going to make you maybe have four of these instead of having three, and, and that's it. So let's run it. So we're running the proxy on 8080. We have our things here started. Let's put it bigger. So as you can see, both are connected. And now I'm going to connect to 8080, and that's going to balance to one of the servers, do all the WebSocket stuff for us, do the sticky for us with just this chunk of code we wrote, and that will be it, hopefully. And there we go. And we connected. So it got proxied to this one here. See, there's a connection. So it went to the 1338. And now I can say, hi. And that will be relayed by the guy that is on that one. So the four something, which is on 1338. And now I can just talk to him. And the message gets back. So that's it. That's what Node HTTP proxy is, making it extremely simple for you to build something like that with custom code, whatever you want to do, in a matter of minutes. So that is all. Uh, if you guys want to see the code that I did here, I just put it on GitHub. There's no license, because I don't think anyone will ever want to use it. And probably it's better not to have a license in case someone thinks that they want to. <laughs> that way I can go like, no, 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 like, no I won't, don't license that. Uh, but you can get the code here, and you can find out and play around with it. And then if you have any questions, feel free to come to me. You can also go to Arnu. He has a lot of depth. He actually knows more about HTTP proxy than I do. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, guys.